have your Bibles, turn with me to Judges, the 11th chapter, and uh, we're going to read verses 1 through 11 and conclude at uh, verse 32. Judges chapter 11. And if you can get it on the screen, we certainly will appreciate it. Now, Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor. And he was the son of a harlot. And Gilead begat Jephthah. The next verse. And Gilead's wife bare him sons, and his wife's sons grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah and said unto him, Thou shalt not inherit in our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tob. And there were gathered vain men to Jephthah, and he went out with him. And it came to pass in the process of time that the children of Ammon made war against Israel. And it was so that when the children of Ammon made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to fetch Jephthah out of the land of Tob. And they said unto him, Come and be our captain, that we may fight with the children of Ammon. And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, Did not ye hate me? Didn't you kick me out of my father's house? Why are you come unto me now when you're in distress? And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, Therefore we turn again to thee now, that thou mayest go with us and fight against the children of Ammon and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, If ye bring me home again to fight against the children of Ammon, and the Lord delivered them before me, shall I be your head? And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, the Lord be witness between us if we do not so according to thy words. Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him head and captain over them and Jephthah uttered all his words before the Lord in Mitzpah. Verse 32. So Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them. And the Lord delivered them into his hands. I want everybody to stand on your feet and I want you to go to three people, repeat the subject after me. Take somebody by the hand and shake it like you're going to shake it off and tell them, neighbor, don't count me out. <laughs> Just tell somebody, don't count me out. I know you wrote me off. You didn't think I was going to amount to much, but don't count me out. And I'm a Ooh. Oh, Lord. Take your seat, please. 
Our Father and our God, bless this witness and charge it with your power. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Black History Month is an annual observance originating in the United States, where, is it, where it is also known as African American History Month. It has received official recognition from governments in the United States and Canada. And more recently, it has been observed in Ireland, the Netherlands, uh, the United Kingdoms. Its purpose is to make all Americans aware of this struggle for freedom. Historically, many African Americans and their contributions to society have been left out of the American history books. Hence the need for Black History Month. Growing up in the 50s and 60s, the only image we saw of black people were ignorant laborers with no education. Sambo, a docile, simple-minded Jim Crow and Jezebel, to name a few. The racial stereotypes of early African-American history had a significant role in shaping the attitudes towards African-Americans. Even in the church during the 50s and 60s, we didn't know that the first person to do something of note after the flood was a black man by the name of Nimrod. There are three ways that you walk with God. When you walk behind him, it speaks of your obedience. When you walk with him, it speaks of your fellowship. When you walk before him, it speaks of your perfection. Because when you perform, when you are before me, I can see all of your flaws. And the Bible says that Nimrod was a great hunter before the Lord. We didn't know that the first Christian church was founded by some Cyprians from Cyprus and some Africans from Cyrene. So it's important for us to know something about those things. The first man whose name is synonymous with eloquence is a black preacher by the name of Apollos. The book of Judges chronicles the year of the history of Israel between the death of Joshua and the appointment of Saul as their first king. What we see in this book is a scene of utter lawlessness. Israel repeatedly would abandon the Lord for false gods. God would punish them for their sins by allowing their enemies to defeat them and enslave them. After a time of enemy oppression, Israel would repent. And God would raise up a judge to deliver them. They would be set free from their enemies. And then the cycle would repeat itself all over again. The spiritual climate in Israel during those days is summed up by the last verse in the book of Judges, chapter 21. It says, in those days there was no king in Israel. There was no monarch. There was no centralized government. For every man did what was right in his own eyes. In fact, left to ourselves, we too have a tendency to go away from God. Particularly when things go well. Have you pondered on the truth? That more people fail the prosperity test than the adversity test. When we are blessed, when we are promoted and exalted, 
there is every possibility to forget the one who blessed us and wander away from him. On the positive side of this book is the fact that God never completely forsook his people. They failed him and he chastised them. But he always took them back. And when they returned to him in genuine repentance, he would take them back again. And that reminds me that God will never forsake us or reject us. Thank God he doesn't easily give up on us. If he did, some of us wouldn't be here today. While the times of the judges were dark, and dismal for Israel. A few lives stand out as bright lights against the darkness. We read of several different leaders in the book of Judges like Ehud, the left-handed judge, Shamgar, a fearless fighter, Deborah, Barak, and I'm not talking about Osama, Gideon, Samson, and several others. But one of them is the man before us in the text today. In this passage, we're introduced to a man named Jephthah. And I believe his story can be a source of encouragement to each one of us today. In the first verse of this 11th chapter of Judges, we see several things. In the first verse, get it on the screen. The name of Jephthah's father is Gilead. Gilead means strong. The first verse also lets us know that his mother was a harlot, a woman of the night. She no longer had private parts, she had public parts. And then third, he was a mighty man of valor. Down through time, people had many hard things to say about Jephthah because he offered his daughter up as a burnt offering before God. So it's true that he would not fully measure up to all of our modern ideals. But remember this, Bishop Amos, he lived in the morning of human history. He lived when the light was dim and he was true to the light that he had. He was true with a rugged fidelity that will cause him to rise up in the day of judgment and condemn many of us. Jephthah had been greatly wrong. He never had a fair chance. He was wrong in his very birth. Note, he was born with some burdens that he didn't ask for. If you take note of his birth, he never had a fair chance. He was the son of a father who was unfaithful to his marriage vows. Chapter was a child of shame. His father, although married, had sown his wild oats. And of necessity, that was a harvest. He was a result of his father's fling. In other words, possibly a one night stand. His father suffered, but sad to say, he was not the only sufferer. We need to be reminded again and again that no man ever sins alone. Your sins will affect somebody. Just touch somebody and tell them your sins will affect somebody. Tell them I cannot go to hell alone. I cannot plunge out into the dark without involving another soul, at least in some measure, in my tragedy. 
this father sinned. It means suffering for him and the one who is altogether blameless. It means suffering for his boy. Not only did Jephthah have as a part of his life the tragedy of an unclean father, but he had an unclean mother as well. His mother was a social outcast because she was a woman who made it her business day by day to sell herself over the counters of iniquity. She was one of those who, whose feet in all ages take hold of hell. So Jephthah had a bad chance. He was the fragment of a home that never was. He had no father to dad to own him. And the first eyes into which he looked were the eyes of an unclean woman. And the first lips that kissed him were lips soiled and stained by years of sinful living. Poor little baby boy chapter. What are the most precious memories in your life today? What are the scenes to which you look back with deepest love and tenderness? I know they are the scenes of your childhood home. But the secret of the fascination of those dear scenes is this. That we saw them by the glow of the light of love. Most of us think tenderly of our early homes because... They were presided over by a father and a mother who knew God. And the one accord that has failed to snap between us. And the good life is the cord that ties still to the faith of our fathers and mothers. When I think of my upbringing, I have good thoughts. I had a father who corrected me. And a mother who loved me. And when my mother would beat me, she would beat herself at the same time. Because not only did the strap hit us, it would always hit her in the back. And she would tell us, you know, that beating hurt me just as much as it hurt. <laughs> and my brothers and I, we would laugh because her beatings didn't hurt that much. Not like my father. He had a belt he called straightener because it would straighten you out. Even now, a smile comes on my face when I think about their counsel. As a young person, many times I did not understand the whippings. But as an adult, I did. And I am forever grateful. But Jephthah missed all of this. His father was unfaithful. His mother was unclean. Some psychologists say that when a child grows up in a home without one of his parents, they know whether or not they are a wanted baby. There's usually a shame or guilt associated with their parents' behavior. Spirits of rejection. Spirits of abandonment and fear coming to a child in the womb under those circumstances. There were no tender and holy associations that made it easy for him to be good. There were no memories to come in after years and whisper old half-forgotten prayers. There were no fond recollections to lay their hands upon him with angelic tenderness and lead him away from the city of destruction. He was a child of sin, a child of the blackness of the night, a child bereaved of inspiration of a good mother, 
a good mother's life, and the sweet uplift of a pious home. And not only was this man wronged in what he missed, he was equally wrong in what he suffered. Early, he was branded with a shame, not his own. In this society in which we live, we forget that a child is no more to blame for the circumstances in which he was born than he is to blame for the current of the sea or the darkness of the night. But Jephthah was blamed. He was pegged with the bastard's curse feeling like he didn't belong and sometimes invisible. The second verse, look at the second verse. It lets us know that the house in which Jephthah grew up, all of his brothers and sisters had the same mother and father. He was the brother of another mother. And ugly names were flung at him before he was old enough to know their dark and sinister meaning. He was forbidden to go to the big house of his father before he knew why he was not allowed to go. He was excluded from the games of those more fortunately born than he when he could no more understand why he was excluded then he could keep back the bitter tears of childish disappointment. Can't you see him as he watches his brothers and sisters play in a distant play tag? I heard the preacher say last week at my church, when we used to play tag, we would say two pounds of washing powder. Two pounds of soap. If you're not ready, holler out Billy Goat. <laughs> oh, y'all don't remember that. <laughs> Amen. Playing in the distance. Can't you see him in his lonely heart saying, I'd like to play Crazy Eights too. Fantasy Sports, 2000K, and pin the donkey. And the gate is shut in his face, and the gate of shame is not his own. By and by, youthhood becomes early manhood. And according to the second verse, the parental estate is to be divided, and chapter is disinherited. He's driven from among his people. He is forced to flee his, for his life, not because he's crazy, not because he's a criminal, not because he's not human, but because he had a different mother that they called strange. Note, your family is supposed to to be the one that loves you and accepts you, even if no one else does. To be rejected by your own family is one of the most painful things anyone can experience. And I'm sure Jephthah felt pretty worthless. Probably one of the reasons why Jephthah became a, a valiant, valiant warrior was that he had to in order to survive. He had to become tough inside and out just to be able to survive in his cold world. Note, this rejection could have eroded his confidence and self-esteem. Rejection is something many of us have faced at some point in our lives. People are rejected for several different reasons. Every day in the United States of America, people experience rejection because of the shape of their body. I know I can't get no help in here. 
because of the community they come from or the color of their skin. So we have this obsession with fair and lovely, fair and handsome, not realizing that each of us are fearfully and wonderfully made. It could have caused him so much emotional pain and anger that it destabilized him, but it didn't. My brothers and sisters, I believe that our God is a God who specializes in taking those whom people reject and taking the least of the least, the weak and the downtrodden and the marginalized and making something beautiful out of them. Bible said he chose the foolish thing to confound the wise. He chooses the weak things to shame the strong. He chooses the lowly things, the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He picks us up from the miry clay and sets our feet on a rock to stay. We see this truth demonstrated in the life of the Lord Jesus. The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. Hallelujah. Now the third verse, and I'm about to close here. The third verse tells us that Jephthah takes up refuge in Tob or Tob with its mountainous fastness and with its rude heathens who are less kind than those kinsmen of his own claim to be worshipers of Jehovah. Sometimes folks outside the church treat us better than folks the church ought to be a place of comfort for the people and not conflict. So we have here the material out of which the young man is called to build a life. He has no parentage. He has no kindred. He has no friends. Nobody believes in him. Everybody expects him to go wrong. They say, oh, Oh, yeah, that's Susie's boy. She died in the gutter, so you can't expect anything good to come out of him. Note, it's not difficult to go down when everybody expects you to go down. Oh, just touch your neighbor and tell him that. It's not difficult to go down when everybody expects you to go down. It's a great thing to have somebody to trust you. That's a tremendous help. If you feel that there's somebody who counts on you, who believes in you, you're not without an anchor. As time passed, Chapter developed a reputation as an inspirational leader. He is making the best out of his situation when something ironic happened. We're told vain men gathered themselves to Jephthah. The phrase vain refers to those who are unemployed, those who are bankrupt, those who are empty. They were idle men looking for something to fill their time. We do not know why these men flocked to Jephthah. Maybe they saw an emp empathetic and, and dynamic leader in him. We see Jephthah becoming the leader of this ragtag band of misfits and outcasts. He was able to mold these misfits into an effective fighting force. Note, Jephthah's actions, when you read the text, are giving us three reasons why you shouldn't count him out. And look at your neighbor and say, there are three reasons why you shouldn't count me out. Come on, take somebody by the hand and shake it like you're going to shake it off. There, there are three reasons why. Number one, 
because I'm not going to give up on myself. Just look at your neighbor and say, I'm not going to give up on myself. He refused to surrender. He said, if nobody else believes in me, I'll believe in myself. If I'm robbed of my inheritance, I'll make my way my own self. And note, he did not spend time going from house to house telling people how much he had been mistreated. You know, that's how some people are in church. I've been heard in the church, going from different churches, bouncing over here, bouncing over there. I've been hurt. No, he did not spend time boasting about what he would do if he was well off as his half brothers. He went to work to build his future, his own fortune, and little by little he won. He also understood that success is inevitable for those who are smart enough and don't give up. Take your neighbor by the hand and tell him success is inevitable for those who are smart. And don't give up. He also understood that, if, that you are capable of having full control over your reality. If one thing doesn't work, if it doesn't work out, that doesn't mean I'm a failure. It doesn't mean that nothing will work out. He also understood that if he gave up, no one would remember who he was. Look at your neighbor and tell him, if you give up, nobody will remember who you are. Life is like riding a bicycle. To keep your balance, you have to keep moving. Note, you were born, look at your neighbor and tell him, you were born to win. But to be a winner, you must plan to win. Prepare to win, expect to win. Confucius says it doesn't matter how slow you go. As long as you do not stop. Wayne Gretzky said, you miss 100% of the shots you never take. John F. Kennedy said, victory has a thousand fathers, but defeat is an orphan. Uh, reason why you ought not give up on me is because I'm not going to give up on myself. Don't count me out. Second point. The reason why you can't count me out is because I got skills. Look at somebody and tell them I got possibility innate within me. I got stuff I haven't even tapped into yet. The Bible says that God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Deuteronomy 8 and 18 says, for it is God that gives you the power to get wealth. Psalms 18 and 32 said, it is God that girds me with strength and makes my way perfect. Matthew 25 lets us know that he's given all of us talents. To one he gave five, to one he gave two, and to another he gave one. Look at your neighbor and say, you got something to work with. <laughs> Acts chapter 1 and 8, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. The text says the elders of Gilead came to him because of his ability. They said in so many words, we rejoice in your prosperity. I'm sure they told him that they knew he would always make something of himself. You've heard that before. After people counted you out and wrote you off and now you're successful, they say, I knew you had it in you. Now can I buy $100 please? We need you to fight Ammon for us because we know you got skills. You're a winner. My brothers and sisters, I believe that if you were, are the sperm cell that made it to your mother's ovary to connect to the egg, you are a winner. You were born to win. But, a, but to be a winner, you must plan to win. You got to expect to win. Uh, don't count me out. Don't count me out because, number one, I'm not going to give up on myself. Don't count me out because I got skill. I've got ability. And then 
My last point, and I'm going to sit down because I'm, you know, I'm getting old now. I'll be 73 in two months. I don't do all that hard preaching. I leave that up to the young people. And then finally, everybody say finally. finally. You can't count me out because I know my way to the altar. In other words, I know how to get in touch with the presence of God. Chapter, mm, he understood because of the anointing. I wish I had somebody to help me here. Look at your neighbor and say, because of the anointing, the yoke shall be destroyed. Yeah. You may have rejected me, but I know my way to the altar. Do you hear me? You may laugh at me. Look at your neighbor and say, but I know my way to the altar. Do you hear me? I may be frustrated, but I know my way to the altar. Every now and then, I get disappointed, but I'm so glad I know my way to the altar. Sometimes I'm embarrassed, but thank God, I know my way. Yes, sir. Down on my knees. I'm about to take my seat. When trouble arrives, I talk to Jesus beyond the sky. He promised me he would hear my plea if I just tell him. Look at your neighbor and say, tell him. Uh, Y'all ain't saying it right. Come on, like you in a Pentecostal church. Tell him, tell him. Down on my knee. You may have put me out, but I'm going to tell him. You may have outnumbered me, but I'm going to tell him. You may have repudiated me, but I'm going to tell him. You may have called me everything but a child of God but I'm gonna tell him greater is he I gotta take my seat right now greater is he greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world yay yay Oh, everybody say, Lord, have mercy. Don't count me out. Go to about three people and tell them, don't count me out. Because I'm not going to give up on myself. Don't count me out. Because I have skill and ability. Don't count me out. Because I know my way to the altar. Tell somebody, don't count me out. My heart is fixed and my mind is made up. I'm going all the way. I'm going all the way. All the way with the Lord. Hey! 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 Lord! Everybody stand. Let's worship the Lord. Thank God for a spirit of stick to itiveness. Thank God for a spirit that causes you to persevere. All of us have been in trouble. All of us have been, been counted out. And, but thank God 
that we had enough faith and strength to keep on going. Tell somebody I'm going to keep going and I'm moving in the right direction. Faith does not back up. It doesn't walk sideways. It moves in the right direction. Tell somebody, some people move by bus. Some people move by train. Some people move by airplane. But tell them God is moving. How does he move? By his spirit. His wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps on the sea and rides. 